Do you think you know how to beat Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon? Well, you don't, unless you happen to have this official strategy guide that tells you exactly how to beat the game the intended way. The front of the guide doesn't show us much, while the back of the guide shows off some of the new features in the Ultra games that the base games didn't have. Like these people, does anybody remember all four of their names? Probably not. As for the inside of the guide, we have a map of the four Alolan Islands and a basic introduction to Pokemon in case you've never played Pokemon before. It shows us how to catch Pokemon, how types work, abilities, and goes a bit more in-depth than the usual guides we've looked at previously. It even lists the version exclusives and an explanation on the mechanics new to Generation 7 like the Rotom Dex and Ride Pokemon. The back part of the guide actually has about 200 pages or so of stuff, which is roughly the same length as the guide itself takes to cover the main game walkthrough. I didn't really realize how much extra stuff there is in these games from random side quests to catching legendary Pokemon and Ultra Beasts, Team Rainbow Rocket, and so much more. The back of the guide has a type chart, outlines of what each shop sells, information on every move and ability, and it even details every extra thing you can do in the post game, like in the Festival Plaza, collect all the totem stickers. And unless I'm missing it, there's no berry page or full Pokedex in this 480 page monster of a guide. It does go into detail on all the glasses, which remind me of my own Gamer Advantage glasses that I personally wear, which are the sponsors for today's video. Gamer Advantage offers glasses that are perfect if you're like me and spend a lot of time in front of a computer screen. The lenses offer a light absorbing technology to help reduce the strain on your eyes and after ditching my old pair of glasses for these cool Gamer Advantage glasses about a month or so ago, I've definitely noticed a difference. They work very well with my prescription and I know glasses like this have been around for a while but they tend to have this weird deep yellow tint to them that makes you look a little bit silly if you wear them out in public. While with Gamer Advantage we don't have to worry about that ugly yellow tint so you can wear them all the time like I do now. I really didn't even realize how bad the strain of my eyes were until I started wearing these glasses and after a few days I noticed that my eyes felt much more relaxed than normal. The personal pair that I wear are the Obsidian Horizon Frames, but if you want to go crazy and get a pair of green or even hot pink glasses, Gamer Advantage has you covered. Use my link in the description to get 20% off your own glasses from Gamer Advantage that can be fitted to your prescription. Thanks again to Gamer Advantage for sponsoring this video. Our focus will be on the main story, becoming the champion, following the guide as closely as possible while trying to ignore my prior knowledge of Pokemon to see how good this guide really is. So let's dust off our 3DS, pop in a copy of Pokemon Ultra Sun, and beat Pokemon Ultra Sun exactly as intended. While the game is loading us up in Alola, the start of the walkthrough shows a recommended route and a brief outline on every sub-event, all 158 of them. These are mostly just small tasks that take a few minutes to complete, then it shows us the daily tasks, and finally, Mele Mele Island. Compared to Sun and Moon, the tutorial part in this game at the very start is a bit quicker. We get to pick our starter much quicker than in Pokemon Sun and Moon, and if you were ever curious to see which main series Pokemon game lets you pick your starter the fastest or the slowest, I have a video where we do exactly that linked below. Kukui then meets us on Route 1 to pick our starter Pokemon, and the guide details the strengths and weaknesses for each starter option by saying how Rowlet may seem weak at the start, but it's a solid choice in the early game, how Lidden will be great at the start, but weak at the later trials in the back half of the game, and how Poplio has a lot of weaknesses to Pokemon you'll see early on on the first island, but has the potential to finish on a high note. I ultimately picked Rowlet because from the guide's description it seemed like it would be the best all around, and it's just adorable. I needed to subscribe because, well, if you aren't already subscribed, you probably should. After exploring the area with our new pal Rowlet, we run into a boy our age named Hao. He asks us to battle and our first trainer battle begins. Hao picks the starter Pokemon weak to ours, so Poplio in our case, and the guide says to use your starter's stab move to defeat him, in our case, Leafage. We then go to Iki Town to save Lily, meet the island Kahuna Hala, then go back to see our mom to heal our Pokemon and also get a Pokeball. I didn't even know this about this game, but if you see your mom once a day, she will give you either a Pokeball, a Heal Ball, or a Great Ball. Back on Route 1, it suggests we catch a Pokemon, so I just caught a Baneri. Then we spy a pair of mysterious trainers from the Ultra Recon Squad who are not from Alola and I'm sure we'll see them a lot more later on. Back in Iki Town, Hao challenges us to a fight again, but this time he has Pichu, which can be a shock to our team. We picked up a Paralyzed Heal on Route 1 to help with Pichu's static ability and defeat Hao in two shakes of a lamb's tail. After defeating Hao, we get our hands on some new glam in the Z Power Ring, so we can do powerful Z moves this generation's weird battle gimmick. We literally just do a silly dance and a Pokemon does a strong move. 
if it's holding a certain rock at least. This then starts our island challenge to become the champion of the Alola region, which is a bit different than it is in other regions, as in Alola we have no gym badges and instead have trials which give out Z crystals that sort of act like badges. Alola also has no Pokemon League as of yet and still forming while we're playing through the game. It was cool to see how Pokemon changed the formula a bit from the traditional sense for Sun and Moon and then Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, but I can't help but feel that part of the reason why they did this was to make the game play more like Yokai Watch. Which was really popular and picking up steam during the time of Sun and Moon's development in 2015 or so, before basically falling off the face of the earth by the time Pokemon Sword and Shield came out. We're not quite done with the tutorial yet though, as the entire first island is basically just a tutorial, and using a guide to play through the game might be overkill, but trust me, the guide shows us some cool things later on that you'll probably want to see. For now, we have to go to the How Ali outskirts to see the professor's lab and take a look around because the guide told us to. I never really bothered to check out this area too much, since this is the only time you ever really need to go to Kakui's lab, but Kakui has some cool fish tanks with love discs here that stretch all the way down to the basement, and unlike most professors, he actually lives in his lab. While we're over here, we also catch a slowpoke that I named Twitch, and follow me on Twitch by the way, link in the description to see me stream some Pokemon challenges live, and I also just wanted to make note that for most areas, the guide actually recommends certain Pokemon types based off the Pokemon you'll find around here, which is a nice touch. Something I'll definitely be paying attention to as we play the game, but I won't be mentioning it on every single route. Sure, for a lot of these early routes, there's no way for us to get like half of these types I suggest, but it's helpful later on knowing what Pokemon to use. The next page then shows us the Pokemon Center and the PC. It says to use the PC, so we use it even though we have no actual use for it yet because we only have two Pokemon, and then make our way over to the trainer school. The trainer school is a special school for teaching kids how to become expert trainers. Luckily, your stint at the school will be brief. We can do one of the side quests here to get a quick claw, an item the guide references a bit later on, but we make our way through here pretty easily defeating all the trainers. The guide suggested we catch a Magnemite nearby, to hit Rising Star Joseph's Ekans with special moves, as Ekans' ability Intimidate lowers your attack, but not special attack. Our reward for all this is the EXP share, a totally not controversial item in Pokemon whatsoever, especially recently, and we get to meet Ilima, the first Island Challenge captain. With our school out of the way, we can continue into Hao Ali City, the largest city in all of Alola. There's a lot of extra stuff we can do here, like change our outfit, eat a Malsada with Hao, and fight Team Skull, the evil team of this generation who don't really do anything and are just evil to be evil. The guide even suggests psychic type Pokemon like the Slowpoke we just caught, which is perfect. After defeating Team Skull, we fight Ilima, but not part of his trial, we just fight him because he challenges us. The guide mentions how his Smeargle, or this particular specimen as it calls it, will have Ember, Water Gun, and Leafage to hit your starter Pokemon for super effective damage. Despite this, our Rowlet, Magnemite, and Slowpoke, and Buneary get through him, although we barely use Buneary after this point. Slowpoke and Magnemite though, definitely the MVPs. This allows us to get to Route 2 and more importantly, to the Berry Fields. The guide notes how we should use fighting type Pokemon like Makuhita or Kerbrawler around this point, which can be found in the Berry Patches. But no Kerbrawlers spawn from all the berry patches we interact with, so we just settle on catching a Makuhita. We explore around a bit and level up in order to take on the Verdant Cavern trial to complete the first island. It recommends fighting, electric, and water types, three types we have which is perfect since so far we did everything the guide says to do, even the suggested stuff. Sometimes the guide will recommend a specific type or a move or even Pokemon that's really hard to get so we tend to miss them, but not this time. We use Makuhita at the head of our team like it suggests and clear out the team school grunts to make our way to the totem Pokemon. In our case it's a totem Gumshoes, but if you were playing Ultra Moon it would have been a totem Alolan Raticate. We conveniently find the Brick Break TM2 in this trial for Makuhita, making this trial very easy. It also gives us our first Z Crystal. When we leave, we meet our two blue friends again from the Ultra Recon Squad, and then the next page shows us all about Z Moves since we can finally use them now. The guide doesn't suggest we use too many specific Z Moves early on though, but in the later half of the game, it recommends Z Moves for quite a few battles. The Rocky Route 3 lies at the north end of Mele Mele Island, which leads us into the Mele Mele Meadow. This is the only place we can catch the Pom Pom style Oracorio, so I caught one even though we never end up using one. Here we meet Lily too, who lost Nebby, that weird Pokemon she's been carrying around in that bag, so we need to go to the Seaward Cave to find it. The guide mentions how this is the first and one of only places where we can get a Smoochum, an ice type Pokemon, so I catch one just in case, and we end up finding more than we bargained for. 
Those weird blue Power Rangers from the Ultra Recon squad battle us again, but as they only just have one Pokemon on their team that is conveniently weak to fighting type Pokemon, and the guy just told us to catch a fighting type Pokemon, we defeat them pretty easily. After returning Nebby, Hao challenges us to a battle, and the guide mentions how he has a new Noibat on his team and to hit it with fairy type moves, although we haven't encountered very many fairy types at all yet, so we can't go for fairy moves right now, and then it warns us about his Pikachu static ability again, something it does in pretty much every single battle. All that's left to do on Mele Mele Island now is challenge the Island Kahuna Hala and his fighting type foes. The guide specifically recommends psychic type Pokemon like Slowpoke and Smoochum, both of which we have caught before but I only have Slowpoke on the team right now, so we don't have too many repeating types. It also suggests flying type moves like our starter which has Peck, making this a pretty easy grand trial for us. That's it for the main part of the first island for now, there's a lot of optional things we can do here from shopping and exploring a few other optional areas, but I decided to just make our way to the second island for now, Akala Island. This is where the game really picks up as the first island was really just a giant tutorial. We have a lot more freedom to explore and do whatever we want, but since my main focus is becoming the champion of Alola, I focus on the trials, which start off with us meeting Captain Malo and the island kahuna Olivia herself. We still have a few more things to take care of before we can start the trials on this island, which include heading towards the Tide Song Hotel to meet Dexio and Cinna. This interesting pair came all the way from the Kalos region to do some sightseeing in Alola. They're also research assistants for Professor Sycamore of Kalos, and are conducting some research here too. Whatever they're researching certainly isn't battle related because both Dexio's Pokemon are weak to Ghost and go down very quickly. After defeating them, we have a few options of what we can do, and I know I said something like this earlier, but I never really realized how much there is to do in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Sun and Moon are similar in that aspect too, but after using this guide which details every optional area and side quest, it makes this game feel a lot less linear than I remember, since although many of the routes and towns in Alola are just straight lines with maybe one or two turns, you still have a lot to do within them. Route 4 then connects up a few of these optional areas like the Pikachu Valley and two towns full of side quests, but the only thing the guide says to do here on Route 4 is catch an Eevee. This unusual Pokemon can evolve into not one or two, but eight unique Pokemon. That just sounds really cool when you put it like that, so I had to catch one. Once in Paniola Town, we meet Hao again, lay waste to his team with our fighting type Makuhita as the guy suggests, and we're getting a ton of mileage out of this Makuhita. I also just wanted to note how his starter is evolved at level 16, even though the Alolan starters don't evolve until level 17. After laying waste to Hao's team, we head towards the Paniola Ranch and the Moo Moo Paddock. First we meet Mallow and get to ride a Statlin, visit the nursery where we can breed our Pokemon or leave them to level up passively if we wish, and go on to Route 5. This leads into the Brooklet Hill, but first we have to catch up with Hao and meet up with a new friend in Gladian. He's currently serving as hired muscle for Team Skull and is fixated on his goal of becoming stronger. He has Zora on his team which can disguise itself as another Pokemon on his team as the guide warns us, but after defeating Gladian, we can continue along into the Brooklet Hill. This is the site of Captain Lana's trial who uses water type Pokemon. The guide suggests grass types and electric types which is great since we have Dartrix, our starter, and Magnemite. The guide even suggests Grubbin which evolves into Charger Bug, another electric type Pokemon that we do happen to have, but just haven't been using very much. Making our way to the Totem Arachnid fight was easy enough, and against it the guide recommends we give a Pokemon a Quick Claw and mostly use physical attacks since this Totem Pokemon increases its special defense stats. After the trial, we see our blue friends again, who still just have one Pokemon on their team this time, but now it's a Poipul. This then leads us into meeting Hapu, defeating Team Skull again, then making a quick visit to the Game Freak offices before stopping in the Royal Avenue. Nothing too important happens here aside from meeting Kiawe, the captain who specializes in Fire-type Pokemon. We head straight to the Well of Volcano Park to challenge him next, and since we lost to Kiawe on my first try, the guide recommends we catch a Tentacool and then trade it for a Barboach in the Pokemon Center, a Water and Ground-type Pokemon that is perfect for Kiawe's trial. We still have to grind up the Barboach a bit though, and finally defeat the Totem Alolan Marowak. This unlocks the Charizard Glide, a very useful tool for fast travel to places we've been already, allowing us to move forward to see our blue friends again, as well as Colrus, another random side character from a previous Pokemon game that's in the Ultra games too, for some reason. Our next task is to enter the Lush Jungle and start Mallow's trial by finding certain ingredients around the jungle. The guide tells us exactly where to find each of the ingredients, leading us to a battle with the Totem Lorantis. It just spams Sunny Day and Solar Beam, which don't hit our team that hard, allowing us to slowly chip away at it for the Grisinium Z. We're then told to go to Hia Hia City and meet Professor Burnett, who is married to Professor Kakui, learn more about these weird Ultra Beast Pokemon, and catch an Alolan Diglett in the Diglett's Tunnel, which we use against Team Skull's Poison-type Pokemon like the guide recommended. 
Hao helps us in this fight against Team Skull and has a team of four Pokemon, and the guide even says how Hao's four Pokemon should be more than enough to defeat Team Skull's two Pokemon without our help even. With Team Skull out of the way, we arrive in Koni Koni City, which seems small compared to Hia Hia City, but it's still a lively port town filled with interesting little shops and vendors. This includes Olivia's shop, which sells stones for certain Pokemon to evolve. There isn't much else for us to do here though, so we walk along the Memorial Hill and into the Akala outskirts. Here we have to deal with Team Skull's shenanigans yet again, and meet Faba as well as Plumeria. Faba's with the Aether Foundation, something we'll learn a bit more about soon, and then Plumeria is part of Team Skull. She battles us as well, and we exploit her Psychic-type weaknesses with Slowpoke to take care of her team and Team Skull for now, and then check out the Ruins of Life. It is here that we can finally challenge Kahuna Olivia and her Rock-type foes. They're all weak to Steel-type Pokémon, which is great for our Magnemite, and the guide even directly suggests Magnemite or Magneton yet again. So far, we did a pretty good job at using the exact Pokémon the guide suggests, except for that one time we didn't have a Fairy-type. But we also use Alolan Dugtrio here, because it's another Pokemon the guide recommends for this fight that we also happen to have. Before leaving the second island for good though, where the game really starts to pick up, we need to meet Faba at the Hano Grand Hotel Resort first. Hano Grand Resort is the most famous and luxurious resort in Akala Island, in fact in all of Alola. Here Faba tells us about the Aether Paradise and offers to take us there. It's essentially a man-made island, this very large floating structure is where the Aether Foundation work towards Pokemon conservation and protection. I'm sure they don't have any weird ulterior motives that we should be concerned about at all, but we can get a stick here which has a few different connotations depending on the context, but in our case it's just for a far-fetched. We also meet Wick and Lusamine here as well as Faba, who are among the highest ranks in the Aether Foundation. Then we catch a sight out of this world as we get attacked by a mysterious Pokemon that came out of an Ultra Wormhole. Ground-type moves from Babo the Wishcash deal heavy damage, causing it to flee. And then we get a proper introduction to our strange pals, as well as learn that they're interested in Ultra Beast and Necrozma. With the Aether Foundation out of the way, we can now head on over to the third island, Ula Ula Island, which is about the halfway point of our journey. Since we're about 113 pages into the walkthrough and have 97 left, it's actually pretty close to the halfway mark even. Our first stop on this island is Mali City, which has the Mali Garden where we can see Professor Kakui. We'll come back here later on, but there is one side quest here I want to highlight here in the Kantonian Gym. It's just like Lieutenant Surge's gym from Kanto in Vermilion City, and it's one of my favorite parts about this game. It wasn't in Sun and Moon, but having a nice throwback to a gym in a game with no gyms was neat. Getting back to our main journey, we see Lily at the library along with Acerola and learn a bit more about the legends in Alola and how Acerola is related to them. We get the Fly TM, a TM the guide will love soon enough and recommend in nearly every fight, and progress through Route 10 and into Mount Hakulani. We have Wishcash now, which will be perfect for Sophocles trial in the observatory. We also meet Molaine here, a friend of Kakui who manages the PC boxes where we store our Pokemon. The guide even recommends ground types, which is perfect and shows us how to do each of Sophocles' puzzles leading up to the final battle against a Totem Togedemaru. Togedemaru was a little bit annoying with Spiky Shield and its ally Skarmory's, which are immune to ground type attacks. But we push on through with Wishcash to defeat it and get the Electrinium Z, and learn about the festival plaza that Sophocles runs and nobody likes. We're then told to return to Mali Garden to see Kakui again, but we also end up meeting the big bad boss of Team Skull, it's your boy Guzma, an expert bug-type Pokemon user. He's bitter that he was never chosen to be a captain in the Alola region and wants to ruin Alola's traditions and wants nothing to do with Kakui, the Island Trials, or the Pokemon League that's forming in Alola. The guide says how both of Guzma's Pokemon are weak to electric, so Magneton is perfect here, and it also suggests we use the TM Fly we just got from the library, the first of many times the guide suggests Fly. A lot of our Pokemon evolve around this time too, since we also managed to do the Nugget Bridge side quest to do a few battles, which is similar to the Nugget Bridge in Kanto. This pushes us to a couple of routes afterwards, including Route 12, where we finally catch a Houndoom as the guide suggests Fire-type Pokemon every now and then, and I figured now would be a good time to pick one up. We then detour into the Blush Mountain, where the guide says we can evolve our Magneton into Magnezone. A lot of guides we've looked at in the past tend to neglect these type of evolutions in the walkthrough, so it was nice to finally be able to get one of those in a Magnezone. This takes us to Route 13, where Gladian gives us dire warning that Team Skull and the Ultra Recon Squad are both after Nebby, so we have to protect Lily. This sounds like trouble. We meet up with Lily at the Aether House in Route 15, where we fight off a Team Skull Grunt and Acerola drops a bombshell that she is also one of the Island Trial Captains, so we can go to the abandoned Thrifty Megamart to take on her Ghost-type Trial. Even though it's a Ghost-type Trial, the guide suggests Psychic-type Pokemon, so our Slowbro should do, 
but it also recommends Mudsdale for her Mimikyu here. Kind of a weird recommendation, but it does this because of Mudsdale's ability that boosts its defense when it's hit by a physical move, which is apparently good against Mimikyu, a ghost and fairy type Pokemon. I go out of my way to get a Mudsdale anyway, and take some time to level it up, even though I don't think it's the best idea for this fight, but the guide said to do it, so we kinda have to do it. It also suggests Steel-type moves and the Steelium Z for the part Fairy-type Mimikyu, which was more useful since the Z move from Magnezone nearly one-shot Mimikyu. After defeating the trial, we can go back to the Aether House and have another scuffle with Team Skull. We fight Plumeria with our Slowbro yet again, and then the chase is on because Team Skull stole some kid's Pokemon and we have to go rescue it. We have to go through quite a few routes before we can catch up to Team Skull all the way in Po Town. Team Skull took over this town and used it as their own main base, with Guzma living in the shady house at the end of it. In the route prior to Poe Town, we also find the Rock Slide TM, a very useful TM the guide recommends a lot, but not as much as Fly. The guide outlines the entire shady house and all the passwords needed to reach Guzma, where we use Rock Slide and, you guessed it, the TM for Fly, to hammer on those weaknesses and defeat and rescue the kidnapped Pokemon from Team Skull. After returning the stolen Pokemon to the Aether house, we fight Gladian again, who then apologizes to us and asks for our help to protect Lily because they're siblings. Before leaving with Gladian, we have to fight the Island Kahuna Nanu and his dark type foes though. All of his Pokemon are weak to Fairy, but we don't have any at the moment, so we also use our fighting type Pokemon Hariyama since two of his Pokemon are weak to fighting, and defeat him faster than it took me to write this sentence out, giving us the Darkinium Z and allowing us to go back to the Aether Paradise. This is where we learn the truth about the Aether Foundation and have to battle our way through to Lily. In our search for the truth, we learn that Wick was unaware of the Aether Foundation's evil motives to preserve Pokemon against their will, or something like that. I didn't really quite understand it. And I'm not too sure what these evil organizations even do because they make less and less sense as the newer generations come out, but we eventually get all the way to fight Guzma again. All of his Pokemon are weak to Rock, so Rock Slide and the Rockinium Z are great here, as well as TM76 Fly, of course. Dulce then challenges us again when we make short work of his soul Poipol and reach Lily at last. Here we learn that Lusamine is Lily's mother, what a shocker, and then she takes Nebby with her. We have to battle Lusamine to see who gets to keep the Cosmog, and a well-rounded team like Lusamine's means we'll have to switch our Pokemon in and out to exploit their weaknesses. It then tells us all of the weaknesses on Lusamine's five Pokemon, so we listen to the guide of course, since that's kind of the point of these videos, and defeat Lusamine and also get the Moon Flute. We have to then also get the Sun Flute in order to awaken Nebby for good later on, which we can find somewhere on Pony Pony Island, the final island of our journey. When we arrive at Pony Pony Island, we're in the Seafolk Village first, where we can get an Aerodactyl, then visit the Ancient Pony Path in the Ruins of Hope to learn more about the history of Alola along with Hapu, who is the Kahuna of this island. Here we learn that the other flute is on the nearby Executor Island, so we set sail for the island of Longneck Tree Pokemon and defeat a few pincers along the way to collect the Moon Flute and return to the village. Upon returning to the Ancient Pony Path, we see some Team Skull runs again and receive the Poisonium Z after defeating them. This leads us into the Vast Pony Cannon, which has a few things for us to do, like pick up the Dazzling Lane TM and catch the Fairy type Pokemon Carbing for an upcoming Dragon type trial. The guide specifically recommends Fairy type Pokemon and the Dazzling Lane TM we just found. And Carbing happened to be on the route leading up to the trial, and even with Nazzling Leam, it wasn't great in this fight. The Totem Como even had a Roselli Berry, which lowers the damage from a super effective fairy type attack, which the guy just forgot to mention. Luckily, Komo is also weak to Psychic, so our Slowbro can help out, giving us another Z Crystal as we enter the tail end of the game. Behind the trial side is the Altar of Sun, the place where we need to go play both flutes with Lily in order to summon the legendary Pokemon. And to no one's surprise, the legendary Pokemon was Nebby all along, just evolved into a cool lion named Solgaleo. Necrozma then suddenly appears and fights with Solgaleo, ultimately winning the fight and fusing with Solgaleo to form Dusk main Necrozma form. We need to take it out with our super effective moves before it destroys the world or something, although it steals all of the light in Alola and it's our job to get the light back and go through the Ultra Space Wormhole to find it in the Ultra Megalopolis and defeat Ultra Necrozma to save the world. We have some really cool art here depicting the Ultra Megalopolis on page 224, then we fight Ultra Necrozma. One of the hardest fights in any core series Pokemon game there is, as even resisted hits to our Pokemon do a ton of damage. We mainly use Magnezone here as the guide recommended and suggested steel type attacks, but we have to rely on some paralyzed strats to finally defeat Ultra Necrozma after my third or fourth try and restore light to the Alola region. I also thought it was neat that when we lost, we just saw darkness in the Seafolk Village. With the world saved and the Ultra Recon Squad at bay, they even give us their Poipol, we can go and take on the final trial ran by Mina. 
These were all pretty easy battles and nothing really too interesting to note since we had to battle quite a few of the older trial captains in this trial across the entire read, but we did take a small detour to catch Solgaleo which was cool since it's a very strong Pokemon. After Mina's trial, we're not quite done with this island yet though as there's still Hapu, the island Kahuna that we need to fight. The guide suggests we use the Fairy Z-move mainly for her Flygon which I thought was a bit weird since there's definitely better Z-move options for us to use against her mainly ground type team but we also have a grass type in our starter Decidueye that the guide recommended, as well as a water type in Wishcash, to defeat Hapu and complete the final island. Our next task is to journey through Mount Lanakila, which leads us to the Pokemon League. Along the way, we have our final battle with Gladian and run into a Necrozma who doesn't look so good. We can battle and try to catch it, and the guide suggests we status in and get into the yellow range before catching it, which makes a great addition to our team heading to the Elite Four. Then finally, we have the Pokemon League. We stock up on items and challenge them in the order the guide suggests, starting with Molaine. Molaine became one of the Elite Four because his old friend Kukui asked him to. He's a Steel-type user and has a couple of full restores and a full heal at his disposal. All of his Pokemon are weak to Ground-type moves, so put a Pokemon that has a powerful Ground-type move at the head of your team before you begin this battle. Defeat Molaine's Klefki as quickly as possible because it uses Reflect and Spikes, which can make things difficult for your team in multiple turns. His Alolan Dugtrio is holding the Steelenium Z, so keep Ice, Rock, and Fairy-type Pokemon away from the battle, or they may be at risk. Switch your Pokemon as needed to exploit Moilane's Pokemon weaknesses, especially those 4 times weaknesses. After Moilane, we have Olivia. Kahuna Olivia has also joined the Elite Four. Her fossil Pokemon have evolved, and she's added 2 more Pokemon to her team since the last time you battled her. She's also stockpiled with a couple of full restores and a full heal. All of her Pokemon except Probabass are weak to Steel, so put a Pokemon that has strong steel moves at the head of your team. If you caught Solgaleo in Sun version, this is your time to use it. Watch out for the Probass's Earth Power and Lycanroc's Fire Punch though. Ground type moves that were effective for Moling's battle are effective for this battle too. Don't expect a short battle against Probass though, since it can withstand one hit knockout moves with the sturdy ability. And Olivia may use full restores to recover its HP. And Lycanroc holds Rockanium Z, so defeat it before it has a chance to use it. Next up is Captain Acerola, who is also now in the Elite Four. Of course, he's using her beloved Ghost types. Don't use normal type moves, as they'll have no effect on her Pokemon. Dark type Pokemon with Dark type moves are well suited to take on her team, but watch out for Bennett's Infestation. Although Palosade is weak to Water type moves, its Water Compaction ability raises its defense by two stages when they're used against it, so exploit other weaknesses instead. Palosan holds the Gosinium Z and uses a Ghost type Z move, but it won't be effective against your Dark type Pokemon. That battle was finally Houndoom's time to shine, and then we have Kalili. She's a former island trial goer who focuses on flying type Pokemon, something that Magnum can handle pretty nicely. Defeating each of the Elite Four in a row was hard enough, but to become Alola's very first Pokemon League champion, there's one more hurdle to overcome. You need to battle your friend Hao. Hao has added Crabomitable to his team, so he now has six Pokemon. His team is very well rounded and powerful. On top of that, he has four full restores. You'll need to strategize carefully to beat him, study his team's weaknesses and swap moves using TMs and Z-Crystals before the battle. Our team matches up pretty nicely against Hao, although the guide says that Psychic isn't very effective against Ground when suggesting we use a Ground-type attack against his Alolan Raichu, which isn't true. It's still good though since Ground is immune to Electric, leading us into Hao's final Pokemon, his starter Pokemon which is now a Primarina. We also use our starter in Decidueye to finish off this battle how we all started, to become the first champion of Alola and beat Pokemon Ultra Sun how Nintendo intended. Overall, this guide was great. The only mistake I noticed was the one against Hao in the final battle, but other than that, the walkthrough portion alone was packed with good information, showed every side event and optional event that we can do, and even had good recommendations throughout that we were able to follow very closely. I of course couldn't detail every single side quest as there's over 100 of them and this video is already quite long. While Generation 7 as a whole is far from being my favorite Pokemon generation, the guide also did a good job at making this game a bit more fun and showing me a few things that I didn't know about this game before. If you also enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more Pokemon videos. Make sure to check out my other pages and other videos in the description below, and also consider becoming a YouTube channel member as well. Thank you all for watching, have a great rest of your day, and bye bye.